So elemental fluorine is one of the seven elements on the periodic table that if you have it in its pure free state, free state means elemental state, that it doesn't exist as individual atoms, it exists as diatomic molecules. The seven are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Those are the halogens. And right next to fluorine, you have oxygen and nitrogen. And then at the very left of the periodic table, hydrogen. So why do fluorine atoms do this? Well, it happens because two fluorine atoms are more stable bonded together than two individual fluorine atoms. Let's see if we can represent the bonding that exists in a diatomic fluorine molecule. Nonmetal atoms will share electrons, so we're going to be drawing a Lewis structure with dashes because a dash between two different atoms mean they're sharing a pair of electrons. And the technique we learned on Thursday was you want to first add up the total valence electrons that you're going to have in the molecule. Fluorine atoms have seven valence electrons each. There are two of them in the formula, so seven plus seven is 14. So the diatomic fluorine molecule is going to have a total of 17 valence electrons. You then start by drawing what's called a skeletal structure. You take your two fluorines in the molecule and you draw a dash between them because that's going to insinuate that the two fluorines are sharing one pair of electrons. They've got to bond together somehow, so our first approximation is they're going to share one pair of electrons. So when you draw this, that dash represents a shared pair of electrons. This is essentially why diatomic fluorine is more stable than two individual fluorine atoms. That dash represents two electrons. It actually represents one from the left fluorine and one from the right fluorine that are now existing in the region of space between the nuclei of those two atoms. When you're bonded together, those two electrons get to attract to a positive nucleus on their left and a positive nucleus on their right. So they're attracting to two different nuclei, whereas if you broke the two fluorines apart and separated them, then that one valence electron from each fluorine would out now only get to bond to one nucleus. So this actually causes more attraction when the atoms bond together that makes this more stable. Now the skeletal structure is using two electrons. We need to have 14 total electrons in the structure altogether. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume the rest of the electrons are in the outer shell of the two atoms, but they're not forming bonds. They're forming lone pairs, which means a pair of electrons in an orbital that are not used for bonding. And if we realize that octets are the stable configurations and um, Lewis believed that the atoms, when they bond covalently, will try to achieve a noble gas configuration, we're going to try to get eight electrons around each of the fluorines. So if I already have two in the structure, I'm going to start with my left atom and go four, six, eight, and that makes an octet for my left atom. Go to the right atom, 10, 12, 14, and now I've used up all 14 of my electrons. The uh, Two shared electrons in the middle can count for both the left and the right atom. So two, four, six, eight, octet for the left atom, two, four, six, eight, octet for the right atom. And so we would anticipate that this would probably be a good representation of how two fluorine atoms bond together. They share one pair of electrons that allows those electrons to have more attraction, so it's more stable. And both these atoms have achieved noble gas configurations, which we realize are stable because noble gases don't react with anything. Now, each of the molecules we've drawn so far, anytime we bond two atoms together, we've always drawn a single dash, which means one shared pair of electrons. We have a name for that. That's called a single bond. So we would say the diatomic fluorine molecule, the two fluorine atoms are bonded together with a single bond. That means one shared pair of electrons between the two atoms. <clears throat> if we move to another one of the elements that forms diatomic molecules, directly to the left of fluorine is oxygen, and elemental oxygen exists as O2 molecules. Let's see if we can represent the bonding for that. Once again, we'll follow the same pattern. We're going to add up the total number of valence electrons the molecule is going to have. Oxygen is in the sixth tall column on the periodic table, so it must have six valence electrons. There's two oxygens in the molecule, so six plus six is 12. So our diatomic oxygen molecule is going to wind up having 12 valence electrons when it's done. We draw a skeletal structure by assuming the two oxygens are sharing one pair of electrons, so we draw a dash between them. And now this is two electrons. We've got to get up to 12. <clears throat> so like we did before, we're going to try to make an octet out of the left atom first, and then try to make an octet out of the right atom second. So until we get to 12, we have a pair here that's two electrons. Let's go to the left atom, four, six, eight. That has an octet. Now let's go to the right atom, 10, 12, and then we ran out. <clears throat> so we've put all 12 electrons in here. 
The left atom has an octet, but the right atom doesn't. And every once in a while, this is gonna happen. You're gonna use up all the electrons you have, and then you don't achieve this stable noble gas or octet configuration that Lewis predicted covalent bonding would do. So something different must be happening. And so whenever you reach a situation like this and at least one of the atoms does not have an octet configuration, the mistake is the two atoms are not sharing one pair of electrons. They must be sharing more pairs. So what you need to do is you need to go to the atom that has an octet, which is the left one, take one of those three lone pairs and move it into a sharing position and make it a bonding pair of electrons. So I'm gonna take the bottom two electrons, I'm gonna move them over to here and make it a shared pair. Now you get to count four electrons for each of the oxygens. So four, six, eight octet, four, six, eight octet. So we believe that two oxygen atoms bond together by sharing two pairs of electrons, not one. And we have a name for this type of bond. This is called a double bond. So we believe the oxygen molecule exists because the two oxygen atoms are sharing two pairs of electrons between the atoms. If that makes sense to you, let me give you one to try to do on your own. This is gonna be the diatomic <clears throat> nitrogen molecule. And we'll give you a minute and a half or so and see if you can come up with the correct Lewis representation for the diatomic nitrogen molecule. So you may begin. So one of the most important skills from our first unit in this class is to be able to use the periodic table to determine the number of valence electrons for any atom. Nitrogen in the fifth tall column have five valence electrons each. That way you can calculate this molecule must have a total of 10 valence electrons. If we draw a skeletal structure by sharing a pair of electrons, that's two electrons drawn right now, going to the left atom, four, six, eight, go to the right atom, 10, and we're done. We've used all 10 electrons. The left atom has an octet, but the right atom doesn't. So that means this is not stable yet. So when this is the case, you're gonna to have to move a shared pair of electrons from the atom that has an octet and move that, that lone pair into a sharing position. So I'm gonna move these two electrons in and bond here. And that makes still eight electrons for the left nitrogen. But if you count up the right nitrogen, two, four, six, it doesn't have an octet yet. This is not correct either. So you have to take another lone pair from the nitrogen that has an octet, move that into a sharing position, and share three pairs. Now, both nitrogens have octet configurations, so we believe that two nitrogen atoms can bond together to form something more stable than individual nitrogen atoms by sharing three pairs of electrons, and that has a name. It's called a triple bond. So when non-metal atoms bond together covalently, they either share one pair of electrons, which is a single bond, two pairs of electrons, which is a double bond, three pairs of electrons, which is a triple bond, and there are no home run bonds. So this is as high as it actually goes. So this is what Lewis would predict would have to be true if the atoms are gonna bond together to make noble gas configurations. Do we just believe it? Well, we shouldn't. This would only be a significant theory if it actually uh, predicts uh, natural phenomenon or things that we can measure in labs. So we're going to talk about why people believe this is true. I'm going to make some definitions first. 
When you draw a Lewis structure, if you count how many shared pair of electrons there are between two atoms, we call that the bond order. Here in the nitrogen molecule, we're sharing three pairs of electrons. We would say the bond order for the nitrogen-nitrogen bond here is three. So that term is called bond order. It's the number of shared pairs of electrons between uh, two atoms. That's just a counted number. It comes from looking at a Lewis structure. So it's just a theoretical number. Uh, if we wanna relate that to experimental data, natural phenomenon that we can measure, there are certain things we can measure about bonds between atoms. We can measure how much energy it takes to break the bonds. We can have nitrogen molecules. We can zap them with photons of electromagnetic radiation and we can keep raising the energy of the photon, raising the energy of the photon until the bond breaks, and then we go, what photon energy did we use? Well, that's gonna be the energy needed to break that bond. So we can actually experimentally calculate what's called the bond energy, the energy needed to break a chemical bond. So we're gonna be able to measure this. We're gonna see if Lewis's bond orders correlate to bond energy in any way. Something else we can measure is how far apart the nuclei are for two bonding atoms. We do this by uh, uh, diffraction, much like the hydrogen emission spectrum. We diffracted a light through a prism. We actually cause a energy or, or photons to diffract through a crystal of some bonded substance. And from the, from the diffraction pattern, you can actually calculate what the bond length is. So the third term we're gonna use talk about today, bond length, is just the distance between the two nuclei of the bonding atoms. So the first property bond order up here is just a theoretical number that comes from Lewis theory, but the bond energy and the bond length are measured numbers and we wanna see if these measured numbers correlate with what Lewis theory predicted. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the Lewis theory's predicted bond order for nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and then we're gonna see what the measured bond energies are and what the measured bond lengths are and see if they seem to make sense or not. So for the three diatomic molecules we've drawn today, <clears throat> we drew the diatomic fluorine molecule, the two fluorine atoms shared one pair of electrons. That would be a bond order one. In the O2 molecule, the two oxygen atoms shared two pairs of electrons. That would be a bond order of two. In the diatomic nitrogen molecules we just saw, it's sharing three pairs of electrons. That would be a bond order of three, okay? Now, what would you predict about the bond energy for these three different molecules if their bond order increased from one to two to three? Which pair of atoms, the F2s, the O2s, or the N2s, which pair of atoms do you think are held together more tightly and so would therefore take more energy to break the bond? Anybody have a guess before we do that? What do you think? Chlorine, okay. nitrogen. Nitrogen. So the nitrogen has six electrons in the region of space between the two nuclei. So the two nuclei are attracting the six electrons. But in the diatomic fluorine, which only has a bond order of one, there's only two electrons between the two nuclei. I would guess that two nuclei would be attracted more to a group of six negative electrons than they would next to only two. So I think the diatomic nitrogen should have the higher bond energy. Does that make sense? So if Lewis theory is correct, we would think that the bond energies would increase from fluorine to oxygen to nitrogen because the more negative electrons you put between the two nuclei, the more the nuclei will attract to them, so it'll be hard to pull them apart. The measured bond energy for diatomic fluorine is 154 kilojoules per mole. For oxygen, higher number, 495 kilojoules per mole. For nitrogen, it's the highest, 941 kilojoules per mole. So if Lewis was right, and these atoms bond with respectively one pair of electrons, two pairs of electrons, three pairs of electrons, we would expect the bond energies to be higher, and in fact, they are. So that's a <clears throat> little feather in the cap for Lewis theory. It seems to have predicted why nitrogen molecules have such high bond energies, but fluorine molecules have such low bond energies. Now let's think about this one, bond length. Fluorine, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms are all slightly different in size. <clears throat> because they're in the same row on the periodic table, but they have different nuclear charges. So actually fluorine, which has the most protons in the nucleus would actually be the smallest atoms of these three. But because they're all in the same row on the periodic table, they're all pretty close to being the same size. 
So when you're dealing with atoms in a row on the periodic table, and now they bond together to make molecules, now the distance between the nuclei is more related to the type of bond as to how big the individual atoms are. So if you're sharing one pair of electrons as diatomic fluorine is, then that means the two nuclei are gonna be attracted to those two electrons, they're gonna to pull together and there's gonna be some distance between them. So now you have to visualize this. What if instead of only one pair of electrons attracting the two nuclei, you now have two pairs of electrons? What are those nuclei gonna do? Are they gonna pull closer to the extra electrons? Or are they gonna go further apart from those electrons in the middle? Closer. What do you think? Sure. Closer. So that means uh, if you have a double bond between two atoms, it's probably gonna pull the atoms closer together. Lewis would predict that diatomic oxygen would have a shorter bond length. And then diatomic nitrogen has a triple bond. You would imagine that would pull the nuclei even closer towards those six electrons. The bond length would be even shorter. So what are the measured bond lengths for a diatomic fluorine? It's 0.142 nanometers. For the diatomic oxygen, it is shorter as the Lewis theory would have predicted, 0.121. And the diatomic nitrogen is the shortest still. So because Lewis's theory on covalent bonding is able to predict properties that we measure like bond energy, bond length, people go, oh my gosh, I this probably a good chance this is right because we're explaining a lot of natural phenomenon just based upon his theory. Okay, now let's expand this and let's talk about how you could use this to predict uh, sizes and bond energies of different diatomic molecules that may not necessarily be in the same row on the periodic table. So I've got one, two, three, four, five diatomic molecules here and I took the time to figure out what their correct Lewis structures were. So diatomic hydrogen will have a single dash, there'll be no lone pairs. So each hydrogen only has two electrons in its outer shell, that should make sense. What's the outer shell of hydrogen? The first energy level. How many electrons does it take to fill the whole first energy level, which is just a 1s orbital? Two electrons. So hydrogen atoms always achieve duet configurations, not octet configurations. Diatomic chlorine would create octets with a single bond. Diatomic iodine would create octets with a single bond. Diatomic sulfur would need a double bond in order to make octets. And diatomic phosphorus would need a triple bond in order to make octets. Now, if I wanted to draw pictures of each of these, now if the size of the atoms is going to be significant based upon what row it's in on the periodic table, hydrogen is in row one. The atoms at the top of the periodic table are the smallest. So my first picture of diatomic hydrogen is going to wind up being two small atoms. All right, let me hold on a second. Chlorine atoms are in the third row on the periodic table. They're going to be larger. Iodine atoms are in the fifth row, they're gonna be even larger. So when I draw my pictures of these molecules, which I'm gonna eventually do, I'm gonna use small atoms for hydrogen, medium atoms for chlorine, and large atoms for iodine, because based upon their row on the periodic table, size increases going down in the periodic table, we could actually tell that would be true. Sulfur and phosphorus atoms are in the same row as chlorine. Remember, chlorine were the medium-sized atoms. So the sulfur and phosphorus atoms are going to be medium-sized as well. Okay, so with that in mind, here are the questions we're going to try to answer about these five diatomic molecules. Which one has the longest bond length? Which one has the shortest bond length? Which one has the highest bond energy? Which one has the lowest bond energy? And to do that, I'm going to draw pictures. So I'm going to start with the diatomic hydrogen. So I'm going to draw the two atoms small because hydrogen atoms only have one energy level each. And my picture is going to look like this. When I draw my diatomic chlorine, because they're from the third row on the periodic table, they're going to be bigger atoms. I'm just going to draw my two spheres bigger. And notice I've sort of overlapped them a little bit, right? So that overlap is where the shared pair of electrons are going. So somehow you're sharing a pair of electrons in this region of space. Same thing here where the two spheres overlap. That's going to sort of be where the electron sh pair and share we're going to be. Iodine atoms are from the fifth row on the periodic table. They're even bigger than chlorine atoms. So if I draw my picture of a diatomic iodine, I'm going to draw it really big like this. Okay. If we only dealt with these three, then in terms of bond length, you could definitely say the diatomic hydrogen molecule has to have the shortest bond length just because its atoms are so small, the distance between its two nuclei is going to be the shortest. And what's going to be the longest bond length? Well, that's going to have to be the diatomic iodine just because we're starting with such big atoms, they have to have a really far distance between them. So depending upon the size of your individual atoms, that has a lot to say 
about uh, bond length, okay? Let's now draw our picture of our sulfur atoms. They're in the same row as chlorine. So I'm gonna draw them medium size, just like chlorine. I'm gonna draw my picture a little bit different. I want you to see if you can recognize what's different about this picture for diatomic sulfur compared to diatomic chlorine. How's that a little bit different? It overlaps a little more. And that's because it's a double bond. It's pulling the atoms closer together, which means the bond length for the diatomic sulfur would be a little bit shorter than the bond length for the diatomic chlorine. And can you imagine how I'm gonna draw the diatomic phosphorus now? Like closer yet. Can, but more relaxed. Does that make sense like how that is? So the bond length for diatomic phosphorus is shorter than the bond length for diatomic sulfur, and that's shorter than the bond length for diatomic chlorine. But because we have one really small uh, molecule made of small atoms, the diatomic hydrogen, and one molecule made of really big atoms, the diatomic iodine, if the question, what's the longest and shortest bond length, it's not going to be Cl2 or S2 or P2. Those are made of medium-sized atoms. The longest bond length is going to be from the uh, molecule that has the biggest atoms. That would be I2. The shortest bond length is going to come from the molecule with the smallest atoms, and that's going to be H2 because those are the smallest atoms. Okay. Now, for bond energy, what's relatively more important is how many shared pairs of electrons there are. The highest bond energy is going to be the molecule whose two atoms are bonded together with the most pairs of electrons, and that would be the diatomic phosphorus molecule because it's sharing the most pairs of electrons. Which one of these molecules is sharing the least number of pairs of electrons? Iodine. Iodine or chlorine or hydrogen, kind of a trick question. They're only sharing one pair. Does that make sense? So if you're going to try to figure out the lowest bond energy, you want to pick a molecule that's sharing the least number of pairs of electrons. So it's one of those three. Now we've got to figure out how do we break the tie. So I want you to imagine, if you're the two electrons here in the hydrogen molecule, how much would you attract the two nuclei here? If you're the two electrons being shared in the chlorine, how much would you attract the two nuclei here? And if you're the two electrons in the iodine, how much would you attract the two nuclei here? Which one of these three do you think has the greatest attraction between the shared electrons and the nuclei? The iodine molecule and I, atoms? I would say that has the least attraction because the atoms are so big, the nuclei have all these shielding energy levels blocking them. Essentially, the shared electrons right here are really far from the nuclei. Ms. Quickly, do you see that long distance? Yeah. But here, the nucleus and the shared electrons are really close. So when the atoms are small, their type of bond tends to be stronger than if the atoms are bigger. So when you get to be bigger and bigger, bigger atoms, the bonds get weaker and weaker because the shared electrons are further from the nuclei. And in this case, we wanted to know the lowest bond energy, which means the weakest bond. So that would have to come from iodine because the least number of bonding electrons and the bonding electrons are more shielded from the nucleus because the atoms are so big. Okay, so these types of things can be predicted from Lewis theory. They exactly match experimental data. And so this is why we use Lewis structures to represent the bonding in covalent molecules. They seem to be able to predict really well a lot of properties that we can measure, bond strengths, bond lengths, concerning uh, covalently bonded molecules. Okay, so now yes, I wanna sir. go ahead, yes. I know that we uh, talked about uh, bond order, but how do we determine the other diatomic uh, atoms, uh, what their bond order would be? When you draw your Lewis structure, you just count how many dashes you're drawing between the pair of atoms. Right. So sulfur looks like that I could take two valence electrons and make it just like phosphorus. Uh, there's Okay, so let me correct two things. First, by looking at this, Two shared pairs of electrons, that's a bond order of two. Bond order of one, bond order of three, that's how you calculate it. But what you have to make sure you do is when you draw your structure, you have to make sure that each atom has an octet configuration. If you take another pair of electrons and move it into a sharing position here and put a third bond, this right atom will have two, four, six, eight, ten electrons in its outer shell, which will exceed the octet rule. And Lewis said you're never going to have a molecule that doesn't acquire an octet. So that would give you an incorrect Lewis structure if you made a triple bond between the two sulfurs. Does that make sense? 
Yes, I see it now, thank you. Okay, perfect, good, okay. We're gonna try some more complex molecules. Uh, formaldehyde has the formula CH2O, and we're gonna try to draw the Lewis structure for this. Uh, quite often when you have a complex molecule, if you see an atom written at the front, you can assume that the other atoms past that are bonded to it. And we're gonna do the same thing here, unless I were to tell you otherwise, you would imagine the two hydrogens and the oxygen are all bonded to the carbon. So to draw the Lewis structure, first step is to count up the total number of valence electrons. Carbon, fourth tall column on the periodic table, four valence electrons. Hydrogens, first column on the periodic table, one valence electron each. Oxygen, sixth tall column, six valence electrons. So if you add all that up, this formaldehyde molecule is gonna wind up having a total of 12 valence electrons when we're done. So we've got to make sure we get to 12 at the end of our structure. The skeletal structure would put carbon in the middle and then you bond two hydrogens to the carbon and you bond an oxygen to the carbon. So all three atoms bond to the carbon. So unless you're told otherwise, you would assume the first atom in the formula has all the following atoms bonded to it. In this particular skeletal structure, we have three dashes. That means three pairs of electrons. So that's six electrons drawn right now we've got to add six more electrons. The hydrogens, whenever you create a Lewis structure, will always make a duet, octet, or a duet electron arrangement. So by having one bond to hydrogen, it has a duet, the hydrogen's stable, no lone pairs on that, no lone pairs here. The lone pairs can only go on the carbon or the oxygen. And we always want to put the lone pairs on the outer atoms first. So if I have to add six more valence electrons, I'm going to go to the oxygen to do that, not the carbon. And on that oxygen, I'll try to make an octet by going two, four, six, and the six electrons there plus the six electrons from the bonds wind up making 12 electrons altogether. So I've put all 12 electrons in my structure. You are only done when the hydrogens have duets and all the other atoms have octets. So our oxygen has an octet, that's lovely. The two hydrogens have duets, that's perfect. The carbon has three bonds, two, four, six, that's not an octet. This is not the correct representation of the bonding in formaldehyde. What are you going to have to do to make sure you make that carbon have an octet configuration? Double bond with oxygen. And the way you do that is you pull a lone pair off of the oxygen and you move it into a sharing position like that. Does that make sense? Now the carbon has eight, the oxygen has eight, and each of the hydrogens have two. This would be the correct Lewis representation for formaldehyde. Okay. <clears throat> now, we've drawn Lewis representations of covalently bonded molecules today and yesterday. Molecules are neutral species, but you can actually have a number of nonmetal atoms covalently bond together, but they are not going to be neutral. And if they're not neutral, they're not called molecules. They're called ions. And if they're made up of several different atoms, we call them polyatomic, many atomed ions. And there's gonna be a bunch of polyatomic ions that you're gonna to wanna to know for our second test. You don't need to know any of these for the first test. You should know our 56 elemental symbols because on the test uh, for you guys next week on Tuesday, I'm gonna say, draw the Lewis structure for a potassium atom. You go, potassium, what's that? And you look on the periodic table and there's just a P and a K written on the periodic table and you gotta know which one's potassium. So if you don't know those elemental symbols, it's gonna be hard to do that. So those need to be known for the first test. These polyatomic ions you're gonna to need to know for our second test. They're groups of nonmetals that are covalently bonded together, but somehow they've acquired some excess electrons or maybe they've lost electrons. So they now carry a charge. And because of that, they're called polyatomic ions, not molecules. And when you draw a Lewis representation for a polyatomic ion, we're gonna follow the same rules as before. It's atoms that are covalently bonded together but I've got to show you how to account for that negative two charge that this polyatomic ion carries. So the first step is to add up all the valence electrons in the molecule. Sulfur and oxygen in the same column on the periodic table, they each have six valence electrons. So there's six from the sulfur and the four oxygens are six and six and six and six, or I could just say four times six. So the sulfur and the oxygens are gonna add up to make a total of 30 valence electrons in this polyatomic ion. The rub is it's not a neutral molecule. That's not the correct number of electrons in a sulfate ion. Because it has a negative two charge, has it gained two more electrons or lost two more electrons? Gained. 
Okay. And negative two charge means you've gained two extra electrons. So you've got to go plus two more electrons, and that'll give you the correct number of valence electrons in this polyatomic ion. So as long as you understand how to do that last step, this is no different from anything we've done before. Once you've determined the total number of valence electrons, we'll follow the steps, assume the sulfur is in the central position, and you bond the four oxygens to it by making a skeletal structure. And your skeletal structure will look like this. I'm making four single bonds here, so I'm using eight electrons, so I've got to get all the way up to 32. So I'm gonna make octets for each of the outer oxygens and we'll see what happens when I get to the end. So right now I have eight electrons in my structure. Let me start with one of the oxygens, 10, 12, 14. Go to the next one, 16, 18, 20. Go to the next one, 22, 24, 26. Go to the last one, 28, 30, 32. Oh, and it worked out perfectly. So I've put in all my 32 electrons. And if you check each of the five elements or each of the five atoms, Every single atom has an octet noble gas configuration. So according to Lewis theory, this would be the correct representation for the sulfate ion. Then to show finally that the sulfate ion is not a molecule, it actually has a charge. We usually put its charge in the upper right-hand corner of the Lewis representation. I think your textbook puts the Lewis structure in brackets and puts the negative two on the outside. So if you like that better, feel free to do that. I tend to leave the brackets out, okay? But that's how you draw the Lewis structure for a polyatomic ion, okay? Let's try one more polyatomic ion together. This one's called the nitrate ion. You'll be learning the names. Eventually, when we come back to school, which will be the week of February 22nd, and you'll be coming back either February 23rd on Tuesday or February 25th on Thursday, that particular first meeting, we're going to have our only quiz of the semester, which is going to be a quiz on nomenclature. Uh, tomorrow's in lab, our activity at 7.30 in the morning will be how to name and write formulas of covalent and ionic compounds. This is something you may have learned in a previous chemistry class, and if you have, then you could go to activity six tonight and start filling out as much of it as you know, or even finish it if you want. But what I'm going to do tomorrow at 7.30, we're not starting at 8, we're starting at 7.30 tomorrow, is I will lecture about half the period on how you write names and formulas of ionic and covalent compounds to make sure we're all clear on how we do this if you're a little fuzzy on that. And you'll have at least an hour and a half left in the period then to complete your activity. So then uh, when we come to the first week back in school, which will be February 23rd or 25th for you guys, then uh, we're gonna take our nomenclature quiz, which will be 20 compounds, which you're gonna either write the formula or write the name for and you need to get 17 out of the 20 right in order to pass that quiz. And that quiz will be taken in the lab room. You'll have a periodic table that only has the elemental symbols on it, so there'll be no names written, and there'll be polyatomic ions you'll need to know on that quiz, so you'll have to know the elemental symbols in your polyatomic ions in order to uh, do well on that, because there'll be a significant number of those. So after you're done with your test next week on Tuesday, then you're gonna wanna start focusing in on these little polyatomic ions and make sure you learn them if you haven't remembered them back from Chem 3 or high school chemistry. So to draw the Lewis structure, once again, we'll add up the valence electrons. Nitrogen atoms have five valence electrons. Oxygen are six, six, and six. And there's a negative one charge on the nitrate ion, so we have to add one additional electron for that. That gives us 24 valence electrons altogether in the nitrate ion. The skeletal structure would have the nitrogen in the central position, and then we would bond three oxygens to it. It would look like this. That skeletal structure is using six electrons. I have to get up to 24. So I'm gonna make octets for my outer atoms first. So here we go, we've got six drawn already, starting at one of the oxygens, eight, 10, 12. Go to the next one, 14, 16, 18. Go to the next one, 20, 22, 24, and I'm done. So now that I've put all of my electrons in, you verify that each of the atoms have octets, and in this case, the nitrogen does not. So this is not the correct Lewis representation for a nitrate ion. We need to move a lone pair from one of the oxygens into a sharing position. So if I take, let's say from the right oxygen, move that lone pair here, bink, now I have a perfect octet configuration for all four of the atoms, okay? And little negative charge in the upper right-hand corner. Now. Professor? Yes. Or actually, I'm gonna let you talk first. And then I'll ask my question. Okay. See my answer. What I did 
to make this nitrate ion is I randomly decided I'm gonna pick the right oxygen and move a lone pair from the right oxygen into a sharing position to make my double bond. But that's not the only way I could have done it. You have two other oxygens you could have moved a lone pair from to bond with the nitrogen. Does that make sense? So if I could have moved the lone pair from the left oxygen, my Lewis structure would have looked like this. If I would have moved the lone pair from the bottom oxygen, my Lewis structure would have looked like this. If you can draw multiple Lewis structures for a molecular ion, because a double bond could have been made with different atoms, we say this molecule possesses the property of resonance. This is a property that occurs when more than one Lewis structure can be drawn for a molecular ion. Ms. Quigley, is your question becoming relevant now? Yeah, I just forgot what that was called. I was gonna ask you, so. Okay. Do you see why they call it resonance? You know what that means? They thought four to all three of them. That the molecule is flipping from here to here to here to back to here to back to here to back to here to back to here. And so they named this property resonance. Okay. In fact, none of these are actually correct. These are actually called resonance structures. There's a name for them. Each Lewis structure that can be drawn that obeys the octet rule is called a resonance structure but it turns out that the real molecule is not flipping back and forth between these because when we actually measure bond lengths and bond energies in a nitrate ion, something very different happens. I want you to think about this. If you were measuring bond energies in a nitrate ion, you would imagine that these two bonds would have a different energy than this bond. Does that make sense? What would these bond energies be compared to this one? They would be less. Exactly. And then we could do the same thing with bond length. These two bonds would be longer and this one would be shorter. So we would imagine if you could took X-ray diffraction pictures of a nitrate ion, you see one short bond and two long bonds. We don't see that. We see three medium bonds. So what we believe is happening is the real structure of the nitrate ion is not any one of these resonance structures, it's the average of all three. So the bonding in the real nitrate ion appears to be the average of its resonance structures because all the bonds are equal in strength and equal in length. There is not one short one and then two long ones. There's not one strong one and two weak ones. Now watch this, okay, this is gonna take some fractions here. So I'm taking you back to elementary school, okay? So let's take the bond at the bottom right here. What's the bond order of this bond right here? One, one. Right, one, one, two, right? This is a bond order of one. This is a bond order of two. If the real nitrate ion averages these three together, what do you think is the average bond order of this bottom bond in that nitrate ion? Four thirds. You add one and one and two and divide by three. Exactly right. So the average NO bond order is one plus one plus two divided by three gives you either four thirds or one and a third. And you can do that for all three of the bonds in the nitrate ion. Every single bond turns out to have a bond order that's an averaged out to one and a third. If the bond orders are the same, then Lewis theory would predict that the bond lengths and the bond energy to be the same, which is what actually happens. So to show somebody looking at your Lewis structure that the real molecule is the average of every structure we've drawn, you put double-headed arrows between your resonance structures. This is what tells a chemist, oh, the real molecule is the average of those three. None of those are actually correct. If you were to leave those out, then that would be incorrect. Okay? So when a molecule has the property that you could go, wow, I could have made a double bond to the left atom, or I could have made a double bond to the right atom, you have to draw them both, put double-headed arrow between them, and then anybody looking at that will go, oh, the real molecule is the average of those different structures you've drawn, okay? So these are molecules that possess the property of resonance, and we'll see more of this as we continue practicing our uh, bonding and covalently bonded molecules, okay? Now, in 1932, the chemist Linus Pauling was 
working on this whole idea of covalent bonding and he was taking Lewis theory and he was actually trying to explain how orbitals are involved in making covalent bonds. So far, everything we've learned here in this second unit, the only thing we've relied on from our first unit of this course is being able to calculate how many valence electrons an atom has. But we haven't even talked about how atoms have their electrons in 1s orbitals or 2s or 2px, 2py, 2pz. And so Pauling started to go, how can I meld our theory of atomic structure, where we know electrons exist in all these different Schrodinger orbitals, with this idea from Lewis that atoms are sharing pairs of electrons to make bonds. They must be using their atomic orbitals to make these bonds, but how? And so what Pauling did in 1932 was describe how the atomic orbitals that we learned in our first unit that you'll be tested on next Tuesday are involved in covalent bonding. And this theory that Pauling developed in 1932 is called valence bond theory. You make bonds out of your valence orbitals. So valence bond theory says that two atoms share electrons by overlapping a valence atomic orbital from each atom, creating a region of space between the nuclei where the electrons reside. So two atoms share electrons by overlapping a valence atomic orbital from each creating a region of space between the nuclei where the electrons reside. <clears throat> okay, let's take a look at how this works. Diatomic hydrogen. Diatomic hydrogen is made up of two hydrogen atoms. The two hydrogen atoms somehow bond together. They share a pair of electrons. They get a duet configuration and they're more stable. Well, Paulding was saying, well, how do the outer orbitals of hydrogen do this? So what is the valence orbital in a hydrogen atom? Its outer shell is the first energy level. So these are each 1s orbitals that have one electron each. So my hydrogen atom on the left, I'm showing you a picture of a 1s atomic orbital has one valence electron in it. The other hydrogen has as its valence shell, the first energy level, that's its 1s orbital. It has one electron in it. So what Pauling said is that when hydrogen atoms bond, these 1s orbitals merge together, they overlap. And when they merge together, they come, they become one. It's kind of like if you ever were blowing bubbles as a kid, and the two bubbles are floating around and sometimes the bubbles come together and they go and they stick. Well, that's what the orbitals are gonna do. As these orbitals approach each other, they're gonna overlap with each other. They're gonna merge together and the two individual electrons will now spin pair in that newly created orbital as they've merged. So as these come together, they merge into one orbital. And this is really a nice little effect right here. Can you see the really, really yellow region right here? When the orbitals overlap, wave phenomenon, it's constructive interference. The brighter the color means the higher the probability is of finding the electron in that spot. So when a pair of s orbitals overlap and they create one new big orbital, this is now one orbital. It's kind of like a kind of a figure eight kind of orbital now. Well, where's the highest region of probability for the electrons? Right here. Why is that significant? Well, because one nucleus is over here on the left, the other nucleus is over here on the right, and look at this, the electrons are spending most of their time right between the two nuclei. Guess what? They attract the two nuclei towards them. That holds the atoms together. Now, these are called atomic orbitals. Why are they called atomic orbitals? Does that have any meaning to you? Orbitals of an atom, right? Atomic orbitals. Now, when they merge together, this is not the orbital on an atom anymore. What have we created when two hydrogen atoms bond together? What's that unit called? A single bond. That's the what's holding them together. What's this two hydrogen unit called? It's not Diatom. called an atom. Oh, diatomic molecule. molecule. It's called a molecule. So what we've done is we've taken two atomic orbitals, we've merged them into a new orbital, but now it's the orbital on a molecule. So it's called a molecular orbital. So this is the H2 molecule, 
And these are now two electrons in this newly created molecular orbital. This is what Paulding said happens. Atomic orbitals merge together and they create molecular orbitals. And whenever two electrons go into a molecular orbital, it's always gonna be this way. They're gonna have this region of high probability right in the middle. And with the nuclei on either side, the negative electrons in the middle attract the two nuclei. So it essentially holds the two atoms together. Okay, why do they do this? Because electrons have more attraction now because they're next to two nuclei instead of one. So hydrogen atoms, if they ever bump into each other, they will always merge their atomic orbitals into a molecular orbital because now the electrons get to be in that region of space between two nuclei and they get double the attraction. So the hydrogen molecule is more stable than individual hydrogen atoms. So the attraction of the electrons in a molecular orbital, the two nuclei, is what a covalent bond is. At least what Pauling said, that's how he related atomic structure to chemical bonding. So anytime you're drawing a dash in a Lewis theory, every single dash means something like this an atomic orbital on one atom, and an atomic orbital on another atom. It could be S orbitals or P orbitals, it doesn't matter. But those orbitals overlap with each other, merged together, and created something new called a molecular orbital. And two electrons in a molecular orbital is a covalent bond because the negative charge of the electrons in that really bright region there is what's attracting the two nuclei. And so this is what really happens when you draw a dash in a Lewis structure, okay? So that's how Pauling explained covalent bonding that Lewis had sort of predicted two decades before that. Now, Pauling wasn't done. He went on to predict another property of atoms that would help, dis dis help predict what type of bonding they would undergo. And this property is called electronegativity. <clears throat> this is a property developed by Pauling that measures the attraction of an atom for shared electrons. Now, how did Pauling make up electronegativity? What he actually did is if you're gonna, let's say, make a bond between a hydrogen and a fluorine, what he did is he looked up what was the bond energies of a diatomic hydrogen molecule, so the bond energy of an HH bond. He looked up the bond energy of a diatomic fluorine molecule, an HF bond. He took the average of those two and then he actually found out what was the bond energy of an HF bond if the two different atoms bond together. And then he took the difference between the average of the bond energies of the individual atoms with the bond energy of the HF molecule. And then he took the square root of that. And that gave him a number. And that number was giving you a measure as to how much more attraction fluorines have for electrons than hydrogens. Now, he was able to calculate differences in electronegativities between atoms. He couldn't actually calculate anybody's electronegativity, so he made one up. And so hydrogen got assigned a value for whatever reason of 2.1. I think now they actually have assigned it 2.2, but our textbook doesn't have it as 2.2, so I'm gonna leave it as this. And then once you assign one, now you could figure out what the electronegativity is of all the other elements. And what Pauling found is that if you're a metal, well, you're going to have low electronegativities. They're going to essentially be lower than 2.1. And the most active metals are going to be having the lowest electronegativities. Because electronegativity is talking about the attraction of an atom for electrons. That's not what metals do. Metals don't attract electrons. They give up electrons. So they're going to have low electronegativities, lower than 2.1. Nonmetals tend to attract electrons to them. So he found that their electronegativity is going to be high values. And the more reactive or the more active the nonmetal, that means the more it attracts electrons to it, the higher its electronegativity is going to be. So based upon this, what atom do you think has the highest electronegativity from the periodic table? I would say it wouldn't be one of the noble gases. Right, because noble gases don't react. So ignore the noble gas column. It would be fluorine then. And its value turns out to be 4.0. Okay, Mr. Holmes, that makes sense? Yes, Professor. Good. What would be the atom with the lowest electronegativity, not counting the noble gases? 
Is it free? Uh, it, the most reactive metals are opposite of where the most reactive nonmetals are. Nonmetals are active in the upper right. Lithium. Metals are active in the lower left. You would say francium. Actually, cesium is the one with the lowest electronegativity that we can measure because francium is uh, radioactive. There are no stable isotopes. There's no more than one ounce of francium anywhere in the earth at any one instance. And nobody's ever been able to collect enough to measure its electronegativity. But I'm sure if we could, francium would have been the lowest electronegativity. But for the elements we know, it actually is cesium. So there's a nice little trend on the periodic table. Once again, lowest values of this are on the bottom left, upper va higher values are in the upper right, okay? And the significance is, if you know the electronegativities of two different atoms and you subtract them, so you get an electronegativity difference, that's gonna tell you the type of bonding between the two different atoms. So electronegativity differences between atoms indicate their type of bonding. So if you have two atoms that bond together and you look up their electronegativities, and actually I'm gonna put the electronegativities on one of the handouts on my class website. I've got handout eight, which already has bond energies, and I'm gonna add bond energies and electronegativity. So if you ever need to look these up, and remember, it's just easier to do Google, but if you wanted to go to the class website, you can go to handouts and handout eight, will have electronegativities for you. But if you have two atoms with electronegativity of zero, that means they both have the same attraction for the shared electrons. That's gotta be covalent bonding. Specifically, we call it nonpolar covalent bonding, and I'll explain why it's called that in just a minute. If two atoms are bonding together and you look up their electronegativities and you subtract them, and the difference comes out to be a small number, like anywhere from 0.1 up to 1.6, they're still sharing electrons, but we call this a polar covalent bond. If the two atoms that are bonding together have a big electronegativity difference, and that would be greater than 1.7, then in this case, one atom attracts the electrons so much more strongly than the other, the electron actually gets transferred and that's where you get ionic bonding, okay? So let's now, to finish this up, let's look at each of these three specific examples and see exactly what this means, okay? So let's start with two atoms that have the exact same electronegativities. What's that telling us, okay? So two atoms with the same electronegativities would have to have an electronegativity difference of zero. When is something like that gonna happen? when the two atoms that are bonding are the same chemical element. So if you have two nitrogen atoms bonding and you look up on handout eight, the electronegativity of nitrogen, which is 3.0, well, you go 3.0 minus 3.0. That's the difference, okay? It comes out zero. That means that the shared electrons are attracted evenly by the two different atoms. So if you're gonna have two nitrogen atoms bond together, the electron cloud that's formed in that molecular orbital there in the middle is gonna be perfectly symmetrically arranged around the two nuclei because the left atom and the right atom are attracting this electron cloud evenly. So notice the perfect symmetry here. Because it has perfect symmetry, it does not have a different left side or right side. If you have different sides, that's called polar like the earth has a different top and a different bottom, right? The North Pole and the South Pole, they're different. This bond does not have different left or right sides. They're identical because the electrons are being shared evenly. So we call this type of bond a nonpolar covalent bond because the two atoms are sharing the electrons evenly. So both sides of the bond look identical, mirror images of each other. That's called a nonpolar covalent bond. Sharing of electrons, it's a covalent bond, but if you share perfectly evenly, that's called a nonpolar covalent bond. Now, if two atoms have close electronegativities, but they're not the same, there's gonna be a little difference between them. So this is gonna be a situation where you have a small difference in electronegativities between two atoms. And this could happen in a bond between a hydrogen and a bromine. From handout eight on my class website, Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. Bromine has an electronegativity of 2.8. So if you subtract these, you get a difference of 0.7. And that difference is in the range of 0.1 up to 1.6. That's a small difference. That means the atoms still share electrons, but they don't share them evenly. 
So if a hydrogen and bromine come together, the electrons that are in the molecular orbital is not gonna be perfectly symmetrically arranged around the two nuclei. It's gonna get pulled over to one side. Whichever atom has the higher electronegativity is the one that pulls the electrons towards it. This must be the bromine atom. The molecular orbital has its electrons pulled towards the more electronegative atom. And now this bond is not perfectly symmetrical. The electrons spend more time on the left side and they spend less time on the right side. So the bond builds up a characteristic positive and negative end. This is called a polar covalent bond. So it's a bond between two atoms where the electrons are shared, but they're shared unevenly. And when one side of the bond has the electrons drawn towards it, that side of the bond is gonna be slightly negative. Now they don't just put a negative sign next to that green atom over there where the electrons are, because that would look like it's a negative ion. So they use the Greek letter delta and they write a delta, then they write negative. That means partially negative. This is saying the left side of the bond is partially negative. The right side of the bond therefore has to be partially positive because the electrons aren't over there on the right side as much. This is a polar bond, just like the earth has a north pole and a south pole. This bond has two different poles, a positive pole and a negative pole. This is one way to represent a polar covalent bond with the delta negative and the delta positive. The other way is to draw an arrow along the length of the bond pointing towards the negative end. If you do that, that's called a dipole moment arrow. Has a little hash mark right here. See that? That's because this is the positive end of the bond. That's a positive sign. And it points where the electrons are being pulled. They're being pulled over to here. So we call that a dipole moment arrow. And it's something in physics we call a vector. It shows direction and magnitude. It's showing where the electrons are being pulled. And if the electronegativity difference is 0.7, you draw the arrow a certain length. If the electronegativity difference was, let's say, 1.3, you draw the arrow longer and people looking at this go, oh, that's a more polar bond because the electrons are being pulled more strongly. Okay. So professor, the green atom is the bromine? It would be in this case, it's too bad it turned out to be smaller. I couldn't do that, I just found the picture, but it would have to be because that has the higher electronegativity. Thank you. So it pulls the electrons towards it, greater attraction for shared electrons, okay? And then finally, if you have two atoms with extreme electronegativities, then their electronegativity difference is going to be really, really large. And that's what happens in a compound between a metal and a non-metal like sodium chloride. Sodium's electronegativity is really low, 0.8. Chlorine's is really high, 3.0. When you have a difference bigger than 1.6, 1.7 or above, and this one's 2.2, that means chlorine with the higher electronegativity attracts the electron so much more that when the two atoms bond, the whole electron cloud gets pulled over towards the chlorine. So this is the chlorine over there on the left side. And we've created now a negative ion and a positive ion. You've created ions. This is an ionic bond, a bond between two atoms in which the electrons are transferred so you've actually created ions and the attraction between the ions is your ionic bond. So Pauling's idea of electronegativity got people to be able to realize that now on the periodic table, you can predict what type of bonding different atoms would undergo. Generally speaking, metals and nonmetals make ionic bonding because of their big electronegativity differences. But nonmetals have small electronegativity differences, so they wind up sharing their electrons, okay?